Cerebus Syndrome is a concept that refers to media that starts off as lighthearted and funny, but changes in tone over time into something much more serious. A great modern example of this would be in episode 6 of the first season of Rick and Morty. Up until this episode, while the show has dark humor and violence, it's more or less lighthearted and funny, following the sitcom formula of everything resetting when the next episode starts, as the characters never really have to face any repercussions. Episode 6 feels just like another one of these classic misadventures, as long story short, while attempting to make a love potion, the pair manages to create a super virus and eventually cause all of humanity to turn into these disfigured Cronenberg monsters. Where previous episodes may just let the pair teleport and escape, instead, something different happens. They jump to a different dimension in which they have been horribly killed and decide to bury themselves in the backyard and carry on living in this dimension as if nothing ever happened. And rather than this being played for jokes, this happens. It's still Some non-diegetic music begins to play and the camera focuses on Morty, who looks visibly shaken and traumatized. Suddenly in this moment, the weight of everything that's happening hits the characters, and it hits the audience too. It feels like there are real consequences and real emotional effects on these characters. Well, as much as there can be in a cartoon sitcom. Of course, going forward, the show would have snapped back into this digestible sitcom formula, but as the show continued, there would always be a proper consideration of more moments like this. And it's part of what made the show so immensely popular. These moments tell a deeper story that both extends across episodes and reveals deeper truths about humanity, or at least, these characters. And in these moments, sitcoms like this can become more of a character study and display the larger themes at play. If you're a fan of Rick and Morty, you probably remember this moment. One, because of the sudden change in tone and whiplash you feel as a viewer, thinking that you were just watching the silly misadventures of a young scaredy cat child and an alcoholic time lord, only to be met with such a heavy scene. But two, as mentioned, it breaks the formula. Not only in content, but how the show tells a story. There's music that serves as an emotional backdrop. The camera moves in interesting ways that it hasn't really done up until this point. And you may think it feels like a different show. Rick and Morty is not the first show to be diagnosed with Cerebus Syndrome, and it certainly won't be the last. Part of what makes this phenomenon so compelling with adult animation is that most popular western adult animation is more focused on comedy. While many of them go to dark places within the story or even in the humor, this is usually to serve as a joke, and rarely ever the characters. As I mentioned, Rick and Morty would have more and more of these moments and get darker and darker as it went on. And while many adult animation shows would do this as well with specific episodes or story arcs, perhaps no show has done it so starkly and paid off so well as Adult Swim's Moral Oral. On the next Moral Oral, one boy will seek understanding through guidance as he discovers that change can indeed be a bewildering wonderment. The show seemed to have a bit of a cult resurgence in the last year or so, which I believe is due in part to audiences being very open and appreciative of animated media that has a darker story to tell or a serious point to make. Take BoJack Horseman for example, which has been nominated for over 40 awards and taken home 15. People are open and ready for animation comedy sitcoms to take a more character driven serial approach, and are okay with the shows changing and delving in to these topics as long as the story is strong. They're a lot more open to this than they were in 2005, when Moral Oral first started airing on Adult Swim. At this point in Western culture, the big three adult animation shows were raging in popularity with their episodic formats, but at the same time, Adult Swim was hoping a burgeoning underground comedy scene gained popularity. Considering all this, it's no surprise that Adult Swim nor the viewers at home were ready or willing to accept what Moral Oral was bringing to the table. However, in three seasons and a quick cancellation, the show manages to pull off some of the most dark, but poignant and effective character development of any animated sitcom, while also acutely and disturbingly revealing horrible truths about religion, conformity, addiction, abuse, gender roles, guilt, lack of innocence, and so much more. In a Reddit AMA, Dino Stamatopoulos, one of the show's creators, spoke about why he chose to present the show in the way that he did. He said, I'm obsessed with these inanimate objects becoming so real that you actually care about what happens to them. Well, I believe he succeeded in this end, as I've never cared for a puppet in the way I cared for the stories and characters in Moral Oral. Sorry, Jim Henson. There's a lot that I want to say about the show and a lot that's already been said. And to be honest, I'm not even sure what I want to say. All I know is that the second I finished the final episode, I knew that I wanted to talk about it. So if you haven't yet, I would recommend pausing this video and watching the entire series. One, because I think it's great, and two, because this video will contain massive spoilers for the show. Hopefully, by talking about the various characters and themes in the show, we can begin to answer the question, what is Moral Oral?
the inklings of moral oral were laid out before its themes in puppet form were even considered. Creator Dino Stamatopoulos first had the idea for a Leave it to Beaver style sitcom starring eccentric punk singer-songwriter Iggy Pop. The show would follow the normal conventions of a family sitcom in which Iggy Pop would be the child of the show, who learned valuable lessons. Apparently he was even to have the same lines and mannerisms of a 12 year old. This offbeat and odd sense of humor would be evident in what would later become moral oral as well. Stamatopoulos pitched the idea to Pop and the meeting didn't go well, as Pop didn't seem interested. However, execs at Adult Swim had known his previous projects like Mr. Show, so that script would be changed and molded into the season 1 moral oral episode, Waste, in which Oral convinces the town to drink their own urine for its health benefit, as it's ungodly to waste things. If this sounds like a gross and bizarre concept for an episode to you, this is a run of the mill episode concept for the show, especially in its early years. In fact, one of the most inaccessible elements of the show is its use of gross out bathroom humor. Almost always, this humor is satirical and played to prove a point. However, at the end of the day, people drinking their own pee is people drinking their own pee, and that can be a barrier of entry into the show for sure. That being said, if you're willing to look past the bathroom and sexual humor, the larger image of what Moral Oral is trying to do becomes clear. For what it's worth, Adult Swim loved this quote-unquote dark humor, and ironically, it would be the shift from these lowbrow dirty jokes into truly dark territory that would be the show's downfall. Once the show shifted into a new format, Thamatopoulos decided to morph it from live action into puppets, which he thought would be a new and exciting medium to play with. Many people assume, as I did, that the show was a direct response to 1960's Davy and Goliath. Davy and Goliath was a Christian claymation show with characters created by Art Cloakey. Hey, I've talked about him before. Which focused on the young Christian boy Davy and his dog Goliath, learning valuable Christian lessons about morality and what is right and wrong in the eyes of the Lord. Creators of Moral Oral are adamant that Leave it to Beaver was a bigger source of influence than Davy and Goliath. So show creators took this want to use a different medium than they were used to, and influences from the sitcoms of the past in which characters learn moral lessons and decided to flip it all on its head, turning the show into a religious satire. It's very clear in its first season that this religious satire would be the core of the show. The premise of every episode is that Oral comes to learn a moral or way to live life by either his pastor, family, or a trusted adult. He misinterprets this meaning in comical, amusing, and often violent or disturbing ways, often hurting himself or others to attain this moral code set by his understanding of this religion. Once he's caught, his father Clay will then discipline him and teach him in the only way he knows how, by beating him, more on that later, and then teaching him the real meaning of the religious lesson. And by real meaning, I mean Clay's own understanding of the lesson, which is deeply coded in the religious, conservative town of Moralton. The setting of the show is vastly important, as Moralton, state soda, is a clear representative of the Bible Belt of America. If this wasn't clear in the name alone, the opening sequence shows state soda and its snug position within this belt. This is obviously intentional, and Stamatopoulos has spoken about how part of the show's inspiration was from a trip he took with some friends to the Bible Belt of America that he had a horrible time on. Thus, the show's creation was a reaction to the religious right during the early 2000s. It's no coincidence that documentary covering this religious indoctrination of children started showing up around this time as well. The infamous Jesus Camp documentary was released only a year after Moral Oral first aired on Adult Swim, and illustrated to audiences the severe and frightening ways in which children were being treated in an evangelical Christian summer camp. So, while in the early to mid-2000s America was facing a slew of geopolitical issues that often featured cultural or religious identity at its core, the number of evangelical Christians in the country was slowly decreasing, as the number of white Christians who identified as evangelical Evangelical went from 23,000 to 21.4 thousand during the years that Moral Oral aired on Adult Swim alone. It's no surprise then that television and film would reflect these tensions as creators aired the frustrations of what they believed to be the hypocrisy of religion and its place in the new millennium. This hypocrisy would be a major through line of the show, even more so than religion. Scott Adsit, voice of Clay, and one of the co-creators and writers of the show said, People might think it's about religion, and it is about religion, but it's also more so about hypocrisy and how people say one thing and feel another, whether that's a good thing or a bad thing. So don't get me wrong, the show is a blatant critique of evangelical organized religion and the effects it can have on society, especially in its first season. However, I agree with Adzit here. Especially as the show goes on and becomes more character driven, it's clear that both the indoctrination of religion upon not just Oral but the entire county of Moralton has turned essentially all of its citizens into hypocrites in one way or another. This is the primary focus of season one. However, each episode comes layered with themes and comments on the true morals and nature of people of Moralton. While it would be fun to go through every single episode and break it down scene by scene, for the sake of yours and my own mental health, let's take one episode from season one and discuss its themes and ideas. The third episode of season one, Charity, begins with Clay and Oral at Mr. Figarelli's store. Clay is picking up some hard milk before church in the morning, a very clear point to the fact that he's an alcoholic, 
put a pin in this for now, but it may be important later on. Oral asks his father for some band-aids because he wants the case that they come in to put his Bible figurines in. When he asks Mr. Figurelli to throw the band-aids out so he can keep the case, Clay informs him that money is very expensive. I'm not the tooth fairy. Money's very expensive these days. And that wasting money is a sin, and suggests that he gets a job at the store to learn the true value of a dollar. The Puppington family go to church, where Reverend Putty gives an impassioned speech about the importance of charity and giving to those less fortunate. Help the poor. If you know what's good for you, amen. Amen. Oral makes his first three dollars and runs into a homeless man on the way home. Being a good Christian, he decides to give the money to the man. In return, the man gives him a little bag of crack. While returning home, Clay is instantly interested in the money that Oral made and seems dejected, ending the conversation when Oral says he gave all of his money to a homeless man. Goody, 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 goody. Let me see, let me see, let me see. Well, that's the best part. I gave it all to a homeless man. What? This points at the hypocrisy of the Puppingtons and really evangelical religious followings as a whole, and their relationships with money. Oral explains that he got something in return, so it was okay, and his parents don't question this unknown exchange for money and some unnamed good that a homeless man gave him at all. This leads into the show's theme of neglect. Put a pin in this, it may be important later on. Oral, convinced that wasting money is a sin, smokes the crack and becomes addicted, working as fast as he can to use all his money on more crack, all while his parents sit idly by. He's no longer making enough from his job, so he tries to return his Bible characters to feed his crack addiction. When Figurelli won't buy them, he attacks him and says, I'm trying to help the poor, you jerk! After quitting, Oral spots a sign saying he can make $10 by giving blood to a blood bank, so he donates his blood and returns to buy more crack. This time, he is busted by his father and asked to meet his father, in my study. This exchange happens almost every episode and usually cuts to the pair in the study as Oral pulls up his pants, implying he has received a spanking from his father. Rather than reinforcing the supposed morals from the Bible, Clay resorts to beating his child. Put a pin in that and may be important later. Clay scolds Oral and Oral tells his father that he was only trying to help the poor. Clay, still drinking, tells his son that the homeless man is actually making a lot of money by selling crack and is lucky to be homeless. Clay tells Oral that he's proud of him for not wasting his money, but lets him know the true danger of crack, being a gateway to slang. This leads into the undercurrents of racism in the show and the white heteronormativity of Moralton. Clay makes an association between crack and black culture, and the thought of Oral using slang is worse to him than, well, addiction. He explains the lost 13th commandment, thou shalt not bastardize the American language. These lost commandments play a part in almost every episode as well, as Clay uses these seemingly contradictory commandments to justify the lessons he teaches to Oral. Clay takes Oral's crack and tells him he will sell it and donate half of it to the church, and stands up to pat Oral on the back and his pants fall down. A dark running gag of the series, as Clay's belt is often used for beating Oral rather than on his pants. Of course, working through an episode like this and explaining the plot along with all the jokes really takes away from what the show is doing. The show uses conventions of children's television such as goofy music and little one-liner quips to juxtapose the darker nature of what's really happening. Boy, Doey, Reverend Putty's sermon today sure made me think. Oral, you know you're not supposed to think when it comes to God and faith. In the true nature of parody and satire, everything is played straight, and it's up to the audience to read between the lines. Not that the show is very subtle in these early episodes, but little gags on signs and funny product names all mean to reinforce the strict and conservative values of Moralton. While most episodes in the season follow this basic formula and similar types of jokes, all of these themes that are played for laughs in a satirical way in this season come back and have dire consequences later on. And if Stamatopoulos and his team set out to make a show that would follow a formula every episode, this formula wouldn't last very long. If you watch any video about Moral Oral, most will use season 1's final episode, or its first depending on who you ask, to mark the show's turning point. While it's not a clear-cut change in formula or content, there's a marked difference in how the show's story is handled, as well as the characters within it. I mention it being seen as the first episode as well, because, long story short, due to unknown reasons, Adult Swim aired the episode as the premiere of the show during a holiday lineup. Most fans refer to it as the season 1 finale, and the episode certainly makes more sense as a finale. The episode is titled, The Best Christmas Ever, and follows the Puppington family on Christmas Day. In many ways, the episode is similar to other episodes of season one. It has similar themes of child neglect, intolerance, alcoholism, and all these little hints that have been weaved throughout the season. However, in this episode, the little morsels of an overarching story and some thoughtful characterization start to really come to fruition, as characters now get to become characters as opposed to purely symbols of religious indoctrination. We get a glimpse into the personal lives of the Puppingtons. 
Clay and his wife Liberta sleep with the giant wall, the Lustgard 6000 in between them. This seems like a pretty on the nose poke at the controversial ways in which evangelical Christians view sex. However, as the series goes on, the Lustgard takes on a separate meaning, as it becomes clear that the real reason the wall is up is mostly because Clay and Bloberta loathe one another. They have a wall between them, so to speak. The couple begin to fight, as Bloberta interprets the Reverend's sermon about Mary and Joseph deciding to keep the baby Jesus, even though he was a surprise, as a reference to their own son, Shapey, who Clay resents and did not want to have. During the argument between them, there is very little in the way of jokes. Even punchlines in the editing, such as the overly optimistic and childish score, are absent, setting a different tone as the episode progresses. In reference to the lack of music, it should be noted, and has been noted by other people who have analyzed the show as well, that the soundtrack is used as representative of Oral and how he views the world around him, especially in these early seasons. His optimistic and happy-go-lucky, carefree innocence are clearly illustrated through this music, which follows him on all of his endeavors. I never asked for a second child, and then boom, Shapey magically appears. Explain that. Shapey. Oral, in typical fashion, overhears the parents arguing and misinterprets it as Shapey being an immaculate conception, believing his little brother to be the second coming of Christ. This is happening against the storylines between Clay and Bloberta, who decide that they want to get divorced, yes, on Christmas Eve. The morning rolls around, and again the show makes a change in editing style, giving the audience some slow, fading shots of Bloberta, who looks like she's replaying the events of the night before and mustering the courage to face the day and conform to her role within society, a role that we haven't even begun to discuss yet. There's no music, no sound, just fading in between shots of a depressed mother as a tear rolls down her face. This is a first for the show. Remember, this was aired during a Christmas lineup of comedy shows on Adult Swim. The children wake up to no presents because after all, we are watching more of Oral, and Oral takes Shapey to get some presents. They walk past the church and Shapey begins to destroy things as he often does. Oral takes Shapey's destruction as a sign of the apocalypse and the boys are soon picked up by their mother. She informs the boys that her and Clay are getting divorced. Upset by this, Oral sets out to find his father and bring them all back together for Christmas. He makes his way to Forgetti's pub, because of course, where else would he find Clay? Oral looks in the window and finds him and his coach, Danielle Stopframe, being awfully friendly in the bar, as Clay confides in him and wishes that he could put his brain in his wife's body. It's worth noting here that up until this point, there are many little references and side jokes to the fact that Clay is seeing, or at least in love, with Coach Stopframe. Up until this point, this is mostly played for laughs, and again seems to fit into the show's narrative of hypocrisy, as Clay engages in a homosexual relationship while he is openly hateful towards anybody who isn't white and straight. However, in this moment, Clay is genuinely going to the coach for comfort, and there are no more subtle references. It's clear that there's something between these characters. Finally, if you've seen any video discussing Moral Oral, you've probably seen the following moment being pointed to as a turning point for the show. Perhaps the best way to really understand the moment is just to watch it yourself. This sure didn't turn out to be the best Christmas ever. But you still have two minutes left, and I have faith in you. There's no funny cutaway to the end credits music. There's no hidden joke. Just vast, empty nothingness. This nothingness that fills the hearts of many characters of the show and creeps around the corners, infecting the citizens of Moralton. A black hole of religious psychosis, abuse, addiction, neglect, and hate. If there was any denying the tonal shift in the series during this episode, the ending of the episode cements what the showrunners were going for the entire time. Once the episode ends, it's clear that there's an underlying story to be told, less about finding the comedy in the many hypocrisies of religion, and more about understanding what it is these characters in the show are actually going through. This is the Rick and Morty moment where things are different, the form has changed, and the show won't be the same again. And believe me, it only gets worse from here. When he drinks, he changes. Oh, he doesn't change, Oral. That's just his true nature coming out. Season 2 starts with more or less a reset of events from the best Christmas ever, at least in terms of tone. Early episodes of the season reflect the usual formula from season 1. Oral misinterprets the Bible, antics ensue, he learns an even worse moral lesson from his father. The very first episode tackles the issue of race within Moralton. Up until this point, there is not so much blatant racism within the town, but rather coded for the audience to believe based on the values and types of people that live in Moralton. However, although this episode is lighthearted in its approach once again, this is when the audience's suspicions about the citizens of Moralton and their relationship to race are finally confirmed. The episode is certainly not the most PC, but this creates an interesting placement of the show within the grander scheme of adult animation. 
For example, the fan base and reputation of South Park vastly shifted over time, as when the writing became more biting and clear, it was evident that the show was first and foremost a satire. By satirizing everything, and no people, race, creed, or topic being off the table, it's become generally accepted by critics and audience members that South Park is simply satire. The general mindset about the show became, if you think it's racist or offensive, you're an idiot, and if you're watching it only for this offensive humor, well then you just don't get it. However, South Park was not always like this. If you go back and watch the first two seasons of the show, it's clear that these outlandish plots and foul language was definitely a part of the appeal. The comparison between these two shows being that once a show has established itself as a satire, it's easier for audiences to swallow once it goes in offensive directions. So like South Park, Moral Oral pulls off this interesting phenomenon where while the show is offensive, dark, and not PC, it still manages to illustrate a progressive message and attract both people who will simply find the shock humor funny and those who will get the satire. It took South Park a few seasons to strike this balance as well. Season 2 follows down this path, continuing to push the dark and sinister humor and imagery while somehow becoming more rich in storytelling and character building. Season 2 zooms out a bit from just the Puppington family as well, focusing more on different citizens of Moralton. This is a good time to bring up the fact that before the show's cancellation, Stamatopoulos wanted a 4 or 5 season show and to eventually rename the show to Moralton, as his plan was to begin to give a clear picture of the town. This can be seen in Season 2 and especially in Season 3, and is curious to envision what the show may have looked like if it had made it this far. Episode 5 of season 2 is a good mix of both the offbeat and disturbing direction that the show was taking, as well as acting as an important note of character building and storytelling that will come into play later on. The episode tackles the idea of offensiveness, and the habit of many religious groups to picket and protest against media that they deem to be offensive. We learn more about Moralton's library and Miss Censored All, and her fascination with eggs. Put a pin in this, it may be important later on. The episode acts as a good illustration of some of the earlier episodes in the season, continuing with the show's brutal and biting commentary on religious hypocrisy with its dark and often gross out humor. An example of this is later in the episode when Oral meets a farmer who takes him to his barn, which has essentially become a peep show strip club for chickens? Not only does the farmer disgustingly sexualize the chickens laying the eggs, but many of the men in Moralton come and pay money to watch them. This sounds like a twisted joke, but it's also used as a commentary for the state of Moralton as a whole, and their relationship to sex. I'll be honest, the episode is unsavory and kind of gratuitous on first viewing, however, in the larger context of the show, the ways in which it illustrates the state that Moralton's in, and delves into side characters like Miss Censored All, does have a payoff, which will come later in Season 3. However, this is not to say that every episode of the season resorts to offensive or dark humor. The show manages to illustrate these dark themes even in episodes that have very little adult content. Take for example episode 8, The Lord's Prayer, in which the Puppingtons meet their new neighbors who seem to mirror them in every way. Oral falls in love with their daughter, and the families end up having dinner together. All is fine and good until the new family, the Posables, say the wrong version of the Lord's Prayer during Grace. The families immediately resent one another, causing the Posables to move away. This is obviously a take on how close-minded evangelist Christians can be, even towards others of a different branch of the same overarching religion. However, there are other themes being illustrated as well. The fact that the families mirror one another points to the ways in which their religions mold them to act a certain way. Their family compositions are more or less the same. The men drink and avoid their families, the women clean and organize and slowly go insane, the oldest child learns from the parents, and the youngest, they're neglected. So much so that when the families split up, they accidentally swap their youngest child, and Blocky replaces Shapey in the Puppington household for the rest of the season. The neglect of the children is clear, as at first nobody even notices that the children are swapped. However, the reality is, there are multiple times throughout the rest of the season where the parents realize they have the wrong kid. They just don't care. Here, Shapey. Shiny. Go get him. Yummy! Dad, that's not Shapey. Oral, you know you shouldn't upset your mother by coming home. This clear example of child neglect will come up over and over again throughout the course of the show. It takes on an added layer of sadness when you look into the character of Shapey. Many fans and analysts of the show believe that Shapey is coded as neurodivergent. He's non-verbal, often screaming to get what he wants, he is destructive of himself and others, and doesn't seem to fully grasp the world around him. This is not to say that neurodivergent people are like this, but rather how neglect and a lack of a supportive family and society can have negative impacts on those in society who need it most. Whether Shapey Shapey is supposed to be read as neurodivergent or simply just a neglected child who's acting out for attention. The reality remains that he is certainly not on the radar of anybody in the show. However, as I've mentioned, the show has a kind of knack for using its side characters to an immense benefit when needed. Besides illustrating this greater truth about the society of the show, Shapey will have a few key moments later on.
In fact, the horrific effects that this society has on children, in particular, seems to be a through line of the seasons. Besides the obvious ways in which Oral has become tainted by his surroundings, the audience gets insight into characters like Doey, Oral's best friend, who's often involved in his various escapades. While the show has many elements that are very obvious and on the nose, namely in its religious satire, it also excels at implying things for the audience as well. For example, it's clear that Doey is neglected as well, as his parents often pay him to leave them alone and accidentally leave them outside because they're too busy having sex to remember him. However, there are many implications to be made about this family dynamic. Doey's parents look to be very young and act in a very stereotypical jock and cheerleader way. They are hypersexual and hormonal, which adds to the reading of them as parents. Could they have conceived Doey while they were young teenagers? Obviously in this religious society, abortion would not be an option. Put a pin in this, it'll be important later. So were they forced to keep their child when they weren't ready? Are they also extremely sexualized because now that they have a child and they're supposedly married, they're free in their religion to engage in sexual activity that was otherwise banned? Of course, none of these questions are explicitly answered, but just by choosing to make them look the way they do, the showrunners open up a variety of implications about them as characters, Doi's upbringing, and again, Moralton as a whole, deepening our understanding of the world that the show has built. This episode also deals with Doi's complicated relationship to affection, as he searches for it from other adults leading him to fall in love with his teacher, Miss Sculptham, who doesn't reciprocate. This leads Doey to spending time with someone who will give him attention no matter what, the creepy ice cream man, Mr. Creepler. This plotline is played mostly for grim laughs, however once again, we must put a pin in the discussion of, as not only will their characters become more well defined, but the jokes about them in this episode will be turned on their head next season. I believe that it's possible to analyze every episode of the show and talk about these reoccurring themes and characterizations, but at the same time, the best way to understand this is just to watch the show. By only looking at one person's reaction to it, you're missing all the little nuanced jokes, the brilliant performances and writing, and some of the things that you probably would rather unsee. However, the final episode I will discuss in this season is its two-part season finale. If you thought the season one finale was morbid and bleak, it was a day in church compared to these episodes. If that season finale was a tonal shift, this episode is a paradigm shift, when the idea of what the show is completely changes into something different. Oral? How would you like to go on a father and son outing together? Father and son? And how? The two-part episode is entitled Nature, and focuses on Oral and Clay taking a hunting trip together. Not only is it a pivotal moment for these characters and for this season, but much of season three will more or less focus on this hunting trip, the offense before it, surrounding it, and its aftermath. Throughout the entire show, with the backbone of Moralton being an extremely religious place, the show critiques not just religion, but signifies issues that exist within what seems to be right-wing policy as a whole. While violence and weapons are used in multiple episodes, the issue of gun control becomes one of the many themes of this episode. As Clay takes Oral into this weapon chamber, where Clay stores his many pistols, assault rifles, and comically medieval torture devices. He explains the significance of his prized possession, Old Gunny, to Oral, which has been handed down throughout all the men in Clay's family. This ritualistic relationship to weapons is clear, and also links to the show's commentary on masculinity. Old Gunny doesn't just represent a family heirloom, but the long line of men who use violence and hunting as a way to prove their manhood, which has wider implications about how they may have treated their children and families. Also, once again, put a pin in Old Gunny, we'll come back to him later. The two head out on their camping trip, and before leaving, Clay makes Oral unpack anything that he deems to be unmanly, like a first aid kit, extra clothes, and food. When they arrive at their destination, this is quickly followed by Clay setting up a tent for all his various bottles of alcohol that he brought on the trip. It is in this episode that Clay's alcoholism will come to the forefront not just to the audience, but to the characters of the show as well. It's been almost two full seasons now of viewers watching Clay burp bubbles where he goes, drunkenly beat his children and drink in his study, and while episodes of the show have taken a serious approach when discussing Clay's addiction, this is the first time Oral does. See, Clay is repressing almost everything in his life, his sexuality, his romantic urges, his struggles with addiction, and he's able to continue to do all this because he's never questioned or argued with. Men and fathers are meant to act a certain way in Moralton, and that's just the way it is. However, as the hunting trip goes on, Oral becomes less and less interested in killing animals, as he would rather befriend them, and Clay becomes more belligerently drunk and more violent. This leads to Clay shooting a hunter's dog in a moment that makes Oral even more uncomfortable than he was the whole trip, leading Oral to speak out against his father. Well, I think you might be... too drunk. This is when the title of the episode, Nature, becomes even more relevant. The episode is not just about the pair spending time together in nature, it's when Oral finally realizes Clay's true nature. Clay begins a drunken tirade which essentially lasts the remainder of the episode. The speech is incredibly well acted, and again, the people making the show use different techniques and form of how the show is presented to illustrate this tonal shift. There's once again no music or funny cutaways. There are long zooming in shots, as both we, as the audience, and Oral are getting inside the mind of Clay. There's intense lighting that's rarely used 
used up until this point. Clay drunkenly confuses the words bright and blight. You should be more like your old man and look on the blight side of life. Blight? I didn't say bright. I said blight. And while this seems to be a drunken misunderstanding, I think it reveals just how skewed Clay's worldview is and how destructive he can be. He does seem to associate brightness with sudden withering death and blight with, well, his lifestyle. Then he screams maybe his most iconic line in the entire show. WHY DO YOU QUIT WORKING ON ME?! Which is just a bomb of a line that can be interpreted in so many different ways. When Clay screams this, he's staring at his own reflection in the bottle. Is he looking into his own eyes and asking this to himself? Some fans think he's pleading to his resentful wife as their relationship is further explored in the next season. I think the most likely answer is that in this moment, he's speaking to God. He's comparing the struggle of alcoholism to how he feels trapped and choked by the religious indoctrination in which he's undergone. She always fools me, Aura. I'll make things better, dear. Drink me. Put me inside you. I'm great. Dang, she chokes me just like every other whore out there. I don't think Clay is using the word woman to describe the women in his life, but rather, woman as a symbol of the relationship he has to God. Drink me, put me inside you, to refer to the act of communion, in which Christians drink wine and eat a wafer to symbolize the body and blood of Christ. He talks about being pulled in and out, much like the ways in which he constantly sins, which puts him in bad standing in the eyes of the Lord. He talks about the women gripping you where it counts, and squeezing things out, things that are like weights around your head, which likely refers to all these repressed emotions that Clay has had shackled to him his whole life. And then, well, the last lines of his speech more or less speak for themselves. Of course, this frightens Oral, who to slip with the gun in his hand and shoot at the moment of this great epiphany, ending the episode on a cliffhanger. One little thing that I wanted to point out is how the next episode opens. During the opening sequence, Oral is usually shown waving at God or making a face or taking a picture. However, opening up from the last episode, the opening ends to show Oral just silently praying, which I found to be both neat and a powerful opening. It's revealed that Clay is okay and that Oral shot his final bottles of booze. Oral tells his father that this was an accident, to which he responds, There are no accidents! Put a pin in this, we'll come back to it later. And that all Oral has done the whole trip is whine like a sissy. Then, for the first time, Oral speaks plainly and bluntly with his father. You become a bad person when you drink! This causes Clay to want to discipline Oral, taking off his belt and falling over, leading into a full childlike tantrum. He then decides that Oral needs to become a man, and drunkenly picking up his rifle, he shoots Oral in the leg. Clay's response is, Oral, what have you done? It should be noted here that this is typical Clay, and multiple times throughout the series, he gaslights and manipulates those around him into believing that the negative things he has done to them are the victim's faults. However, this time, after just shooting his own son, these moments do less to serve the themes of hypocrisy and neglect that have been shadowing Clay, and more to show how truly plain evil the character is. Notice Oral's response. Oral, what have you done? I got shot. By you. The wording here is important, as Oral is still taking the blame for this happening. The way in which Oral's lines are written will become key during this episode, so keep note. Then, in a moment that will surely define Clay as a monster, when Oral points out that he brought a first aid kit against Clay's wishes, Clay insults Oral's masculinity, taking the rubbing alcohol out and polishes off the bottle. Oral's response, while justified, also marks a shift in the way he will talk to his father from now on. I hate you. Clay drunkenly passes out, leaving Oral to fend for himself. And when a bear gets into their campsite, Oral is forced to take the gun and shoot the bear, finally killing his first living thing. I believe that while the full episode marks Oral's loss of innocence, this is a specific moment within them in which Oral's childhood innocence is no longer. It has been ruined, desecrated by an abusive, neglectful father, and being forced to kill an animal, something that he did not want to do, in stark contrast to his relationship to nature in the previous part of the episode. Of course, this idea is almost a trope across all media, that a person's first kill signifies their loss of innocence. Whether you believe this idea or not, there is no denying that after this point, Oral has changed. He's come to realize truths about his father, and by extension, his society that will change him forever. Clay sleeps in a drunken haze for a day, leaving Oral to bleed out, only awakening to ask for a blanket. When Clay finally wakes up, he asks Oral what happened, and Oral says, You shot me in the leg. See how his diction has changed? He knows that his father is a monster now, and he has no reason to mince words anymore. Clay asks about the dead bear, and after hesitating for a moment, Oral tells his dad, No, Dad. You killed it. 
In this moment, even though Oral knows that it would satisfy and impress his father to know that Oral was the one who killed the bear, he doesn't want to or need to impress him anymore. He says that he hates his father, and he means it. The duo return home after a long weekend, and Oral begins his healing process in his bed. In a conversation that will become increasingly significant next season, Oral asks his mother why she married his dad. She plays off the question at first, resorting to the religious explanations that women need to marry men so that they can have straight babies. Oral clarifies that he means them specifically, why did they get married? To which she simply replies, Oh, well, <laughs> why not? Oral explains that he doesn't like how when his father drinks, he changes. And in a moment of possible accidental lucidity from this nightmare of a life, Bloberta responds that he doesn't change. That's just his true nature coming out. Finally, in another change of form, the episode ends in silence with Oral eating his food, as buzzing flies and a crane sit outside his window. While there are many different ways to interpret this ending, the crane does have some biblical significance as being a symbol of God's presence or a messenger from God. Perhaps then, God is still with him, watching him as he undergoes this change, the flies buzzing around the rotten presence that Clay has had on his life. Either way, it serves as a fitting ending to a more nuanced but also grim season. Hey, remember when this show was a comedy about a young super religious boy comically misinterpreting the Bible and causing havoc instead? What happened? Well, there are many places to get the scoop on what happened, so we won't go into too much detail here. Long story short, as Stamatopoulos tells it, the vision that he and the showrunners had for the show did not align with those of Adult Swim executives. Adult Swim loved the edgy and gross out humor, but they didn't like what the show had become, too dark to the point of no longer being a comedy, but a full on drama. After reading various scripts for season 3, and one episode in particular which we'll talk about later, they set out to cancel the show after this season, and reduce the number of episodes in season 3 to just 13. The show coming to an end and the cutting of episodes in the season would not hinder the impact that the final season would have, and what we were left with was a show that had completed its transformation, that had used its premise to lure viewers in, slowly sprinkle a grand narrative throughout them, and then when ready, completely dupe the audiences into investing into the real narrative of the show. It's hard not to talk about every episode in the final season and break it down, but we will focus on key moments throughout that illustrate this culmination of storytelling. You may have noticed that multiple times throughout this video, I've said put a pin in this or put a pin in that. If that's the case, then season 3 is the corkboard on the wall containing all these pins, with interconnected strings and details that seemed inconsequential beforehand. If the finales of season 1 and 2 contain the aforementioned Cerebus Syndrome, then this is when the series adapts its mindset as well, as references and characters that were previously comic relief or the butt of a joke will be morphed in the season, giving their presence in the series a whole new meaning. Season 3 is what Moral Oral was really about all along. One way to read this season is of Oral's awakening. Despite the season one finale, which would be a hint of what was to come, the show followed a very familiar formula. This mirrors something the season will tackle pretty heavily, which is the cycle of abuse. The episodes in their structure and story begin to break this formula. As the show transforms, Oral transforms with it. The show makes this transformation abundantly clear in the opening shot of the first episode, Numb. The intro starts with the familiar zooming in on the globe, but replacing the opening music is the Mountain Goats No Children. The depressing lyrics of wanting destruction and doom and portrayal of a clearly broken relationship will pair well with the content of the episode, as well as the third season as a whole. Instead of zooming further in on the church, this time the camera pans over to the Puppington house and zooms in on there instead, telling the audience as clear as day, the focus of the show has shifted. This is no longer about pointing out the flaws in religion, but rather how the the people within the society live. Something that becomes abundantly clear from the beginning of the episode is the shift on who the show will focus on as well, as the episode follows the life of Bloberta, and what she was up to while Clay and Oral were on their hunting trip. What this represents on a grander scale is a new lens that the show will use, I believe much to its benefit this season, which is that of feminism, giving insight into the plight of women who live in Moralton. This episode focuses on Bloberta's sexual, romantic, and self-abusive lifestyle. We see her vast collection of sex toys becoming increasingly more intense and violent as she attempts to feel, well, something. She clearly gets no affection or sexual gratification from her abusive bisexual husband or the other man in her life, as the show once again tackles the affair between Bloberta and Danielle, resulting in the birth of Shapey. She meets with the coach, who doesn't desire to be in her life at all, and admits to only wanting to use her to get closer to Clay when they first started their affair. Bloberta resorts to begging Reverend Putty to be with her, who cannot, and thus the cycle continues, and she gets a brand new, even more violent sex toy to use on herself. The discussion of Bloberta's sexual dissatisfaction and repression comes to a head when the only source of sexual gratification gratification she feels is through getting her doctor to inspect her abused and mangled lady parts, causing her to abuse herself even further to feel the sexual satisfaction from another man. It is also of note that because of all the men in Moralton are supposedly repressing their own sexualities in different ways, they're unable to ever really please the women around them, if you know what I mean. 
This is, by all accounts, a complicated depiction of sexual repression and liberation, or lack thereof. I use the word liberation here because, within this oppressive society, this is one of the only facets that Blaberta's life that she can control, and it's clear that she seeks to find some freedom from this cyclical lifestyle that she's found herself trapped within. The violent relationship she has to sex and her own body is a theme that I personally haven't seen many shows cover, let alone with an all-puppet cast. The episode culminates in Bloberta receiving the news that Oral's been injured, and then as the episode ends, we get a point of view from Clay as No Children continues again. This time, we get Clay's point of view during the seemingly inconsequential conversation at the end of last season's finale. Clay overhears Bloberta saying those final lines. Oh, he doesn't change, Oral. That's just his true nature coming out. But now we see something we didn't see last time. Bloberta letting out a cathartic cry when she leaves Oral's room. This is cut short because she notices Clay, causing her to get angry and go to bed. Clay follows, but the camera stays outside of their room. Maybe we will never really know the full story between Clay and Bloberta's relationship. Maybe we will never be let in, forced to just peer through the door like their children. The only angle we get is from God's view, showing two people together but separate, who have a wall between them that is technically designed to prevent lustful feelings, but that has been rendered completely useless in this pursuit. As the song states, they are drowning together hand in unlovable hand. The next episode in the season reveals that Oral's awakening, as we can refer to it, has actually started before the hunting trip. The episode explores his fraught, violent, and unhealthy relationship to religion, and once again exposes the abusive nature of his family. Clay punishes Oral by not allowing him to go to church. This begins in almost a humorous way, as Oral begins to lose his mind. However, this leads Oral into essentially going insane and having a near-death experience. This very nebulous and dark moment is once again a break from the show's convention, as Oral floats around in limbo excitedly preparing to meet God and go to heaven. Golly! I think I'm dead! <sighs> this is it. This is really it. God? Oh no. Uh, I guess I didn't collect enough soul insurance. God! Uh, is that you? However, Oral doesn't die, which causes him to essentially attempt to kill himself over and over again so that he can finally meet God. The true neglect and abuse faced by Oral in this episode enhances how disturbing it really is, as Oral is trying to escape after the only thing that comforts him, the church, is taken away from him. Oral's experiences in Limbo become more and more vivid but increasingly ambiguous, leading Oral to envision all the suffering he's endured so far. In a bizarre visual of Oral dressed up as a church, cradling a smaller version of himself and leading him to exclaim, <gasps> Sure. On first glance, this feels like a very average Adult Swim show, which is just eccentric and dark for the sake of being edgy and different. However, I believe this scene, and this episode in general, really points to the paradigm shift that Oral's experiencing. In hurting himself and trying to meet God, he realizes that it is not the church that's been there for him, comforting him and offering him escape from his repressive and abusive life, but himself. He is a church, in the sense that he has been the one caring for himself. For one of the first times in the show, we actually see Oral getting spanked by his father in the study. And every time he gets hit, we see Oral as a church, slowly sinking further and further out of it, leaving the solitary church against the sinister red and black background of the afterlife. The effects that the religious repression of Moralton have had on Oral are finally coming to a head. He has quite literally had the indoctrination beaten out of him. We come now to a true pinnacle of the show, and as the story goes, the episode that more or less got the show cancelled, Episode 4, Alone. This episode would tackle some serious and morbid themes with respect, grace, and unrelenting reality, all while adding nuanced emotional depth to multiple previously simple or flat characters. The episode follows three of the women in Moralton and is more or less about the plight that many of the women face underneath the oppressive society, specifically in the realm of sexuality. The episode doesn't feature any of the main cast and is completely devoid of Oral's arc, instead branching out to develop the characters surrounding the story. We come first to Nurse Bendy, who up until this point has been illustrated as a young bimbo who has only ever been used for sex by by all the men in her life and who is stereotypically dumb. The show uses the stereotype they've created about her to bring an added layer to her character. She arrives home and begins speaking to all of her stuffed animals, dressing like how a child would perceive a mom, and more or less acting like a child. This seems to be comical at first, however, as her story progresses, we learn her true feelings as she begins to say grace before she eats and cries, clearly frustrated with how the people around her treat her as an object and how nobody acknowledges her feelings. Thank you kindly for keeping our joyous family together under this one love-filled roof. We all need people who aren't mean to me, or that don't act like they only care about doing dirty, awful things to you. I feel thoughts of emotions, and I need people to know that. 
Jones. It's important here to explain something that we learn later in the season, that Nurse Bendy has a child that she was unaware of and was meant to keep a secret. Joe, a minor character in a few one-off episodes who is an underdeveloped bully, is revealed to be this child. The show never explicitly delves into how disturbing this is, given that Joe is said to be 12 throughout the show and Nurse Bendy to be 24. It's evident that Bendy has been a victim of child SA and has had her own childhood stripped from her in the process, causing the age regression we see in the episode as a response to her trauma. This becomes abundantly clear when she bends over to clean a spill and her teddy bear falls on top of her in a suggestive manner triggering her into an emotional breakdown. In these few minutes of story, the characters recontextualize the character's place within the show and portray a surprisingly deep and honest example of a survivor. In a later episode, Nurse Bendy does get as close as the show can give to a happy ending, as she ends up adopting the also immature and underdeveloped Joe, giving her someone to care for and giving Joe someone who cares. But this does not diminish the disturbing and impactful episode. Unfortunately, Miss Goldsum's arc in the episode is no less disturbing. She arrives home and immediately it seems to be evident that she's experiencing some symptoms of OCD. She comes home and sits down to take her pills, revealing a bloody clothes hanger, a clear symbol of an abortion. She takes off her clothes and stares at a family tree, revealing her once blonde hair and smile, now replaced with dark hair and a look of depression. Sculpton's story is told through visuals and the radio, as she does not speak, and the radio begins to discuss the arrest of the previously mentioned ice cream man, Mr. Creepler. The aforementioned episode featuring Doey and his attempts to date Miss Sculpton and winding up with Mr. Creepler are given a follow-up, as it's revealed that Sculpton has dyed her hair and sacrificed herself to get Creepler caught and thrown in prison. It's revealed that by keeping her door unlocked at night, Creepler came in and presumably raped her, which is what led to her having to get an abortion. One thing to note here is that there was a scrapped episode script that Stamatopoulos posted online called Rape, in which it's revealed that she actually had twins and one had survived, causing her to go to prison to confront Creepler who is no longer there. Once again, previously flat characters have been given a dynamic new outlook, one as an unseeming hero and one as a pure monster. Sculpton's story also outlines an often overlooked element of sexual assault survivors, which is the complicated relationship they may have with the attack or the attacker. As Sculptum is shown fantasizing about the experience and then feeling immediate shame. This idea is given even more depth when one considers the prevailing sexual repression that everybody in the town already feels in the first place, adding what is undoubtedly an intense and uncomfortable layer to this already, honestly, daring story. Not only is the plot transgressive for an adult comedy show, but in the greater context of survival stories and media dealing with the subject matter, the show explores ideas about it in just a few minutes that I've rarely seen discussed in other places. Finally, the third story of women's sacrifice comes from following Miss Sensordal, who has even still a different relationship to sex. Sensordal wants control, as seen in her words, but also her diorama of the town, in which she pretends to control all the people around her. She is also still fascinated with eggs in a slightly perverse way, calling back to that bizarre episode we discussed earlier. In the episode, Sensordal talks to her mother on the phone, where it's revealed that at a young age, before she had any say in the matter, her ovaries were removed without her consent. This has caused her to want to regain control, as she had very little in her childhood. It also explains her infatuation and sexual correlation with eggs. The story again gives new meaning to the previously unseemingly solely bizarre egg jokes, as well as explains Sensordal's uptight and power-hungry nature. Her sexual life was stripped of her before puberty, and this has caused her to have a skewed, negative view of sex. Her pursuit for power will become more relevant later in the season as well. This episode delves into three very different women with three very different stories. However, these women are united in the everyday struggles they face due to the desecration of their sexual lives. Not only does the episode further reveal the dynamics of living in a place like Moralton, it tragically disassembles what the audience thought we knew about these often hypocritical and stereotypical characters of women, and that makes them human. Flawed and human. This notion of flawed and human is one that defines the characterizations during this season. It would be remiss to discuss this idea and not bring it back to the Puppingtons themselves, as the latter part of the season shifts the focus back to them. Clay is truly evil and rotten to the core, and the show doesn't try to downplay or change that. He will not see a redemption. However, what the show does do is explore the circumstances that led to someone like this, and how in the context of Moralton, the issue is much bigger than Clay himself. One way that it does this is achieved in the episode Help, in which the conversation between Oral and his mother is explored in more detail, asking why did Blowbird marry Clay? The episode contains bits of backstory that develop both Bloberta and Clay in unexpected ways. We learn that Bloberta comes from a hateful and neglectful home herself, and we learn things about Bloberta that change the couple's dynamic. For example, it's revealed that before meeting Bloberta, Clay doesn't drink, and Bloberta pressures him into his first drink by explaining that Jesus drinks, so it's okay if he does. But this goes a step further. Clay proceeds to get very drunk and hit on another woman, which causes Bloberta to become angry and knock him out. When he comes to, she lies to him and tells him that he fell, and that she is taking care of him, which causes Clay 
to feel wanted and cared for, and leads to them getting married. This detail adds so many complex layers to Blaberta and Clay as a couple. Not only was their whole relationship founded on a lie, but also Clay has been manipulated into it by Blaberta. This adds a wrinkle into Blaberta's character, but it also illustrates Clay as something we've never seen him as before, a victim. He was pressured into drinking, which would later lead to his own struggles with addiction, but also was taken advantage of in the situation. However, this is not the only portrayal that delves into Clay's psychology as the following episode, Passing, acts as a backstory specifically of Clay, and delves into the cycle of abuse that Clay and by proxy Oral are both a part of. The episode focuses on Clay's upbringing. The first thing of note is that as a child, Clay is actually a lot like Oral. He too is uncomfortable holding a firearm and only agrees to so that he can impress his father. Aside from this, we learn that Clay is also a bit of a mama's boy, and that after many miscarriages, his mother was finally able to give birth to him, which makes her extremely overprotective of him, which no doubt inflates his sense of self-worth. When going through old photos, Clay's mother explains this to him, and once Clay realizes that he isn't her precious only ever, he fakes his own suicide using his father's gun in a cruel prank fueled by his own selfishness. His mother, overcome by emotions and with a bad heart, no doubt caused by constant smoking and drinking, dies as a result of this prank. During this moment, Clay's mother says something of note, something that no doubt had an impact on Clay. What happened? I don't know, it was a mistake. There are no mistakes. Two of my last bottles of liquor? Sorry, Dad, it was an accident. There are no accidents. This incident causes Clay's father to resent him, which is something that we see Clay do throughout the whole series, wielding guilt like a weapon, as his father did. However, possibly the biggest insight into Clay is how we understand his own abuse. In the moment of anger, Clay's father winds up to hit the child, but changes his mind, stating that it's not even worth it. In this moment, Clay learns to associate abuse with caring for someone. If you hit someone, you're showing them that you care about them and their actions. This causes Clay to begin to act in increasingly negative behaviors to provoke his father to hit him, creating a disturbing cycle in which the only way Clay understands affection is through physical harm. This is not to suggest that every time Clay hits Oral that he's actually showing that he loves him, but it explains why he always resorts to hitting Oral. Clay is not a monster of his own volition, but rather one that has been created within a cycle of religious oppression and various forms of abuse. Not the kind of nuance you expect from a show in which one of the first episodes involves people drinking their own urine. Although not common, the season does feature moments of reprieve and redemption as well, similar to Nurse Bendy's ending. One character that does become more or less redeemed as the series goes on is Reverend Putty, who is surprisingly progressive for being one of the symbolic heads of the church in a place like Moralton. One arc involves Putty, who is portrayed as sexually repressed and frustrated throughout the whole show, involving himself in an affair. This affair causes Putty to experience guilt and self-loathing, which is more than what can be said for most of the characters in the show, who engage in selfish and disgusting behavior to no moral consequence. In a way, this completes the quote unquote arc of Putty, who realizes that maybe it's better to be celibate than to rely on sex that ruins the lives of others. The showrunners had planned to tackle this even further in another scrapped episode called Narcissism, which would have had Putty realize his own narcissistic nature in his sexual attempts. However, another way that Putty is shown to be one of the only decent people in Moralton, at least in his actions, is by pairing him with one of the only other moral people in the town, Stephanie. In an often under-discussed and appreciated episode of recounting Stephanie's expectedly horrible experience growing up as a lesbian in Moralton, Putty illustrates acceptance in politics that will be shared by the showrunners as well, ending Putty's story as maybe the only redeemable man in Moralton. These limited warm and fuzzy feelings do not last long, as even three episodes out from the ending, the show is taking as many opportunities as possible to bring depth to various side characters. In a great episode featuring the men of Moralton sharing a drink on Easter Sunday in a bar, which I won't discuss fully because it's worth watching, the episode ends with Shapey giving giving his one and only line in the show. Up until this point, the neglected Shapey usually just screams or cries and yells that he is thirsty, and of course is often denied. Drink! No Shapey. Then, in an unexpected moment of clarity, he says, gotcha, mommy. Hey, gotcha. Not now, Shapey. No milk. When I'm thirsty, it feels how I feel when I'm alone. What? Shapey is not just thirsty for milk, he's thirsty for attention, a thirst that we never see quenched throughout the entire series. And to see this child understand and articulate his own neglect in this moment is truly heartbreaking, which comes in a long line of heartbreaking moments from the final episodes of the show. Side note, Shapey is voiced by Stamatopoulos' child Tigger, and the behind the scenes video of her doing her lines are very cute. Take a second and watch them before we begin talking about the show's end. Shut up! He was actually telling me what I should write in the second season scripts. What's the line you want to say next season? Cake! Cake? Cake! 
Before we begin to talk about these final episodes, I just want to say that there's so much more to examine of the show than what I'm talking about in this video. There are themes, storylines, and characters that I haven't even discussed, partly because the video would just be too long, and partly because I really believe that when making these types of videos, it's important to push people to watch the content themselves, as it can be hard to engage with any kind of analysis without knowing the work. So, watching this video does not do the show justice, and does not take into account the love, labor, and care that went into making this truly special show. Before discussing the final culmination of the show, if you haven't yet, please turn off this video and watch it for yourself. With that final note, let's see how Moral Oral ends. The penultimate episode of the series plays into what I think could potentially be a full season of the show, showing Miss Sensordal's campaign to run for mayor and exercise this control she so desperately desires. She's campaigning against the current mayor, who we learn is Clay Puppington. This is a stinking dead-end job that he's been complaining about every day. Given that this run for mayor takes place after the hunting trip, we get to see a different dynamic between Clay and Oral, which becomes a focal point of these episodes. Oral joins Sensordal's campaign to actively run against his father, and when Clay takes him into his study, there's a shift in the power dynamic. Through Oral's awakening, both in terms of understanding who his father really is and the ways in which his organized religion has failed to support him, Oral has nothing to lose. He doesn't get spanked. He speaks to his father with resentment and contempt. When Clay's speech doesn't go as planned, he uses a new tactic to manipulate his son and takes full credit for shooting him, saying that he's glad that he did. Once again, as Clay says during this moment, truth is the scariest thing that there is for these people. And Clay ignores the truth when convenient and weaponizes it when necessary to get what he wants. And it's this idea of truth that will bring the show to its untimely but fitting end. The final episode acts as a neat closing by return, as it takes place exactly one year after the season one finale on Christmas Day. Sensordal uses a disturbing Oedipal relationship to manipulate Clay into giving her power, and she understands the relationship between sex and power perhaps more so than anyone in Moralton. When Coach Stopframe sees them kissing in the bar, he's hurt, and finds Oral in a similarly emotionally vulnerable position, as both of them now have something to bond over, their hatred of Clay. Stopframe and Oral begin spending time together, and in a somewhat cathartic series of scenes, we get to see Oral spending time with someone who seems to show him genuine care and compassion. Clay becomes jealous and this jealousy gets the better of him, leading him to confront him and Oral. Needless to say, there's a lot happening in this scene. Well, it worked! You got to me! Now you stay away from him! He's not yours, I am! For the first time in the show, Clay addresses his feelings towards his coach head on and in front of his family. He's shown as having emotions and experiencing heartbreak. Of course, he's not jealous of the coach's relationship to his now estranged son, but rather of their romantic relationship. And in a moment that once again adds a layer of depth to Clay, for the first time, we, we hear him say out loud, I love you, and truly mean it. I miss you, Oral. I need you in my life, Oral. And I... I... I love you. We should go. And in this moment, Clay finally has to reap what he's sown throughout the entire show. Although it isn't shown, presumably, his power as mayor is soon to be gone, the control he once had over his son is gone, and the only person who he actually loved out of everyone now denies him. Clay doesn't get the harsh punishment that we want to see him get. He doesn't get a huge monologue from Oral or Blaberta about his wrongs, or arrested, or killed. Instead, he gets something real. We see what happens to abusers once the power they hold over their victims is stripped away. Because his power is how they judge their self-worth, they're left with no relationships and nobody to love them. Not even themselves. But where does all this leave Oral? Is he destined to repeat the cycle of abuse being trapped in this oppressive and depressing landscape? Well, what happens on the in-between is left up to speculation. The series ends with a look into Oral's future, and given the nature of the show, we get the most unexpected ending of all. A happy one. In a montage at the end of the episode, we watch Oral grow up and develop into an adult, shedding the frown he holds as he enters his home on Christmas. We see him age and develop, we see a loving family, and we see a girl who looks suspiciously like Christina, who Oral falls in love with earlier in the series. Finally, we come to a realization that against all odds, in a miracle, as Putty suggests in the voiceover, Oral manages to break the cycle. By acknowledging the unhealthy relationships and family dynamic that he has at a young age, Oral is able to end this long line of neglect and hatred, and get the ending he truly deserves. However, there's a small detail about this ending scene that I believe to be the most poignant and reflects the showrunner's true intentions about the show. On the wall above the couch, we see a cross. It's a small detail, but in the context of a show that is seemingly so vehemently against religion and its values, it speaks volumes. It harkens back to Scott Adsit's quote about the show not being about religion, but about hypocrisy. Oral manages to keep his faith. He manages to take the elements of love and kindness that religion does offer and help him to break the cycle of abuse. 
The show is not saying that you're either a religious nut who's abusive and hateful or you're not. It's saying that unless religious individuals and institutions take proper care into adapting with times and changing the dogma to break these traditions engulfed with abuse, homophobia, racism, sexism, xenophobia, and hypocrisy, that they're doomed to repeat these traditions and indoctrinate a whole new generation of people into only recognizing the hateful elements of a vast religion. Oral is a survivor of abuse and neglect of a society that's corrupted by evangelical religious hypocrisy and he still manages to be a good person and practices faith. And if that isn't the most beautiful ending that this show could have, then I'm not sure what is. The end. Uh, I mean, amen. Nah, who am I kidding? The end. So now, we've looked at the entire series of Moral Oral. We've discussed the idea of Cerebus Syndrome, how a show can start as a comedy, but turn into a drama or tragedy, but also how various plots, conversations, and characters take on a different tone when now examined under a new light as the show changes. We've talked about its creation, its cancellation, and its context as a piece of Western adult animated media released in the early 2000s, specifically in terms of it being heavily critical of religion during a time in America where evangelism was still prevalent, but becoming less popular. We've talked about how it handled themes of abuse, addiction, mental and sexual health, oppression of various types, and many more themes including hypocrisy. We talked about the significance of the final season and how the show managed to transform during its run and transition from a dark and disturbing tongue-in-cheek comedy to a drama filled to the brim with layered and complex main and side characters, all within an 11 minute time frame per episode. But we still haven't addressed the question that this video poses. What is Moral Oral? Well, it's a lot of things. But ultimately, I think it's a story of hope. It's a story of believing in the inherent good of mankind, even when everything around you is pointing you in the other direction. It's a story of hope that even in the darkest of times, it's possible to channel your negative experiences into creating beauty and love and optimism and spreading that with your loved ones. And mostly, it's a story of hope that those who are experiencing oppression or abuse understand that they are still valued and they still have love to give and a voice worth listening to. And as we come to an end, I'd like to thank not only the people behind the show for creating such an impactful and important piece of media, but you for watching me gush over it for probably too long. Thanks for listening. Take it easy.